as James says, we're live and we're continuing on in our study of Genesis, uh, moving right along at a, I don't want to say a snail's pace, but not much faster, but going through the creation stage and we're now reached a stage that pretty much anybody that knows anything seems to know whether they went to Sunday school or not about Noah and the flood. So we're going to reach that point tonight as we move into chapter 6. Uh, some people, it's funny, we had a, a pastor friend of mine that kept coming and telling me his name was Noe. And I'm like, well, his name is Noah, but he called him Noe. But hey, I think we know who he was talking about. But anyway, uh, we're in chapter 6, and then before I open the prayer, we'll get a little background to where we've come from. Is that we open, obviously, with the what we call a total gross, uh, that we're going to move through, which means beginnings. We've seen the beginning in the creation of the earth in chapter 1 and chapter 2. We've seen the creation of man and woman, and then, of course, the fall after that. And then we spent, we spent all of last week's study on studying a genealogy of all these names. And Bill Cale was here. He had to read all those funky names. He did a great job on it. But uh, as a result of it, we, we came to, we got two different lines that are a result of it. And I'll break that down and we'll move into chapter 6 after we open the prayer. Father, we just thank you once again for the opportunity it is to be in your house. We thank you for all those who are here. I ask for a special blessing for those because we know the resistance is strong on Thursday night. They could be anywhere in the world doing anything, but they chose to be here. And I ask for a special blessing upon those. For those who couldn't be here, we ask for uh, traveling mercies. For those traveling, for those sick, those uh, ill, we ask for your healing on the earth. And certainly as Paul taught us to pray in Colossians last week, Lord, personally, I ask that you walk, help me to open, walk through this open door that you've given me and to speak clearly and present your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we said, uh, we have two after Adam and Eve. Remember that Cain killed Abel as a result of jealousy, as a rejection of what God had told him to do. We have two lineages now. If I was a good teacher, I'd have you a board up here with, with a scan on it. And we'd have Adam and Eve coming down, Abel, X, Cain, and then we have another guy named Seth. Coming from the Cain lineage is what we spent most of the time last week. And we talked about Cain was relocated, left the Eden, Eden area, I like that word, and went east to a place called Nob. And was there with being a wanderer. He was cursed. Because he had disobeyed the Lord and not bought the right sacrifice and had killed his brother. And would be a traveler and a wanderer all his life. But we said, hey, that was not the end of his story. As he had three different children. Uh, one was in the music, one was in the metal work, work, and one was a rancher. So they, in the world's eye, they seemed to be successful, but in God's eyes, they were failures. Um, and we talked about a little bit about that. And of course, we saw that... Um, uh, guy named Laban. Remember, there's two different lands. There's a new a one in Seth's line that Daddy was talking about one ago, which was Noah's father, and then Lamech had a son from Cain's lineage. Uh, and then Lamech was a very arrogant man and said, you know, hey, you know, he went and told his wife, probably he had two wives at the beginning of polygamy, and he said, you know, if Cain is avenged seven times, then I will be avenged seventy-seven times. You messed with me. We said, well, why is that would you like to have your husband come in and say, don't mess with me, or I'll, I'll kill you 70 times. But then we said, we juxtaposed that with the righteous lineage of Seth, and that Seth's uh, people really didn't have a tremendous amount of worldly success from what we see, but certainly had a lineage that really produced, you know, ultimately is going to have the Messiah. And uh, one of the things that we said as we went through it, that they did this and they died. They did this and they died. So death was into the picture now as a result of the curse. And then we began to finish last time with two guys named Enoch and Noah. And they were all in Seth's line. And Enoch, we know, was uh, one of the people in the scripture who never died. The other person being? You might know. Start with E. Elijah. Elijah. So those two were, you know, carried to heaven and raptured up and never went. And certainly uh, they had, and of course we have Noah, who we were introduced to last week. 
So that's where we at. The last thing we read, Noah was 500 years old and had uh, three children, ladies. How'd you like that be 500 years old and have three children? <laughs> not, but we're not getting much of a response on that. Well, that's kind of where we ended up at, just going through the lineage and all the years that these people lived. And we said it was miraculous. That we don't think about it that here we have Adam, who lived 937 years, I believe it was. So he was still alive during Noah's age. He would have seen this lineage. He would have seen the, the two different lineages that had to be very discouraged with, you know, Cain's image and all the things they were doing. But even now, we're going to find out this week, even Seth's line, even though they had righteous split, there's a lot of sin in that line, and the world, we see, uh, is going to be out of control. And certainly, we would have, he would have seen Noah, he would have seen Enoch, and all these people that were out would have been alive during the time period because they all lived so long. And that... Uh, Mabudal, which was the great grandfather there, lived the longest of those, I think it was 987 years. So we'd have seen lots of things going on in his lifetime. You know, Angie was talking about her daddy came to Littleston on a cart and saw a lot in his lifetime. How would you like to be no I mean, uh, Methuselah or Adam live all those many 900 years? You'd have seen a lot in that lifetime. But anyway, let's move into chapter 6. And. Uh, Nancy has been volunteered to read the first eight verses. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things, and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made him. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And that's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Certainly may God bless the reading and the exposition of the word that's to come from it. Well, the reason why Moses recorded this short little story here uh, in this chapter is really not so much because of the worldly fame of the things that was going on, but because of its theological importance. There's a lot in it, so I'm going to try to give some different points of view because it's, I don't say it's controversial, but you get some different points of view. In this account, he said God is going to destroy the world as we know it by flood. He's really reached a point, you know, that we've ever, we ever, have we ever said that? I've had enough. You know, get to the point, we're pushed to the point. Some of us, it takes a little longer than others. And some of them, some people have a little shorter views. Uh, I guess it depends on some of the genealogy, right? That's, it's in the blood, right? But sometimes we get to the point we've had enough. And this is the account of nothing more than the wrath of God. Now, I'm the, probably more so than a lot of people. I love to teach on the love, the love of God. I mean, I remember uh, Charles Sexton used to tell me, he said, Rodney, you need to talk more about the wrath of God. You talk too much about the love of God. And he was right to an extent. This is nothing but God's wrath for him. Now, several years after the flood, the Lord would promise that the wrath of God would come again. And that verse is one of Uncle James's, my Carolyn's husband's favorite verses, over in Matthew 24, verse 37, and Luke 17, 26, where it was, as in the days of Noah. That's important. Put that in the back of your mind. We're going to come back and see that in a few minutes. But I'm giving us all that. That when wickedness reaches a certain level, God gets fed up and is going to pour out his wrath on everyone except those who are the recipients of his grace. That's as true in Noah's day as it is today. So this passage really clearly tells us there are limits to God's mercy and grace. And when God has seen enough, We've seen enough. Now, we don't like to hear about that, but certainly we're seeing it firsthand. There's no way around it. But when you're an expositional teacher, you have to teach what comes next, right? You can't pick and choose. Well, the first thing we see is that the Holy Spirit, through Moses, brings out the first two verses. 
we begin to see that during this time period there's a lot of demonic activity. There's five views to that. Now, it says, when man began to multiply in the face of the earth, one of the things we're going to see is in the end times, because what happened in the end times was, as in the days of Noah, huge explosion of population. So man began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto those, and we began to see the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attracted. Now the question is, who are those sons of God? There's been five different views of who they are. I'm going to give them to you. And really let you make up the other mind. But I'm going to give you some facts that I think will push you in one direction. Some people say these are the line of Seth, which we know is the godly line, was mingling with the line of Cain, was the ungodly line. Remember, I said we got two different lineages here. Cain's having his children who were just living in sin and doing everything in rebellion to God like their father. And then Seth's line, who seemed to be a little more. Righteous, but not that they are still sinful. There are others who say these sons of God are what they call fallen angels or demons. Some people say they are lesser gods, spirits of famous demons. Number four theory is they are what we call despots or demons who indwell powerful rulers during this time period. And the last thing to see is some people argue that these are demons who possess all kinds of people. But I think there's two facts that really, because as Daddy said, whatever you want to answer, we go to Scripture to find out what it is. There's two facts that really help us reach our conclusion to most likely these really are. So let's turn over to Job. Somebody can find Job. And I want to read three different verses in Job. Job 1, verse 6. Job 2, verse 1. And then Job 38, verse 6. 1, 6, 2, 1, 3, 8, 7. Whoever gets it, read it. Okay. Yeah. Job 1, 6. Or 2, 7, whichever one. 2, 1, I mean. Yeah, read. Which one you got? One Read that. One day the angel came to um, present himself before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. So, okay. Okay, so you were said angels in that one. Does anybody have anything else different in 1 6? Uh, sons of God. Sons of God. How about somebody Same read verse 2 1? Satan and Mom. You got 2 1? Somebody got 2 1? On another day, the angel came to present himself before the Lord, and Satan also came with him to present himself before him. All right. The short same word you say, eight, the sons of God? Uh, in 2-1. And somebody find 38-7. Hey, you didn't think it would be a joke tonight, did you? Heavenly being the sons of God. So. Anybody got that one? Yeah. That's a, that's a band. That's 38 steps. Excuse me. <laughs> 38 steps. When the morning star is sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. All right. So we get to see, and, and I'm glad that the Lord's version had it. There's this interchange of words in, what, in the different translations that the sons of God is another note for angels. So. We get the impression that if you you know you look far enough in the scripture, a lot of times the answer, remember we said Revelation was very hard, but you'd read something in verse one and about three verses over and said, This is what that is. Well, here we see an example of who the scripture describes the sons of God are angels. Let's turn over to Jude and read six and seven. And then somebody else go to Second Peter 2, 4 through 6. And I'm gonna I'm gonna make my, I'm gonna make this coming to come to yeah, the other second. We might have got Jude 6 7. Don't ask what chapter it is. Because there ain't one chapter of Jude. Jude 6 and 7. I've got Jude. You got Jude? What does it say? 6 and 7. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. 
Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Mm, that's a loaded verse. Mm-hmm. And then 2 Peter 2, 4 through 6, if somebody got that. I promise you I'll make the head of the tail of all this. Second Peter two four through six. You might want to read it. For if God did not spare his own, when they sinned, but cast him into hell, and committed him to chains of gloomy darkness, he was kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world. But preserve Noah, a hell of righteousness. With seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world, will have been gathered. If I turn the cities to us, Saddam and Gomorrah, the ashes he began the extinction, make of them an example of what he is going to have, what is going to happen to the ungodly. All right, so what are we saying is the term when you see Son of God in Scripture refers to angels. And the New Testament confirms that there were certain demons, which are what was a demon? Fallen angel, right? That's what we read in Jude, abandoned their first estate for indulgence in sexual immorality and received a severe punishment for it. Now we know they there's a severe punishment because they were cast into what we call the abyss. Now anybody that studied Revelation, remember that abyss that was open? It had the key, it was given to the uh, the demon that he opened up and all that stuff kind of smoke came out of it and the demons came out and they stung people and all that stuff from Revelation. This is the abyss, the, the holding tank where these fallen angels were cast and are, and are in bondage as we speak. So, because of it seems to be very safe to conclude, not saying I'm 100% foolproof, we've got all these other different ideas out here, but the sons of men are fallen demons fallen angels, which are demons, who either came to earth in a human form, or indwelt men and women, lived in the world in an unparalleled time of corruption during this time period. So, what do we see? The future one is when they act. The activity of these demons took place when the population was extremely explosion and large. There was five, probably millions and millions of people that we don't know about. So, we've seen over these, what, almost 900 and something years here, that uh, since Adam came in and that the population kept exploding, 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 it was huge population. And not only was the population large, but guys, there was lots of beautiful women. That they were going to find out because the scripture tells us that. So apparently, when the numbers were small, there was a little bit better to monitor and control what was going on. When they got big, things began to get out of control. You know, the larger stuff gets, the more it gets out of control. So we see when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, they had children that were born, and these demons saw that the women were very attractive. Uh, and that's what stimulated these demons was that these women were so beautiful. A uh, word that certainly refers to their physical beauty. Well, just what did they do? Well, these demons took wives of all whom they wanted. As Jude said, they went after, Nancy read, strange flesh. These demons certainly had the pick of the women and really went after all of these. Now, Dr. Merrill Unger in his commentary said this was, quote, a catastrophic outburst of occultism. One of the things that we read in Scripture as we did our prophecy study into the signs, and one of the signs of the end times is there's going to be this explosion of the occult, all this satanic activity, which we see on earth people obsessed with demons and zombies and satanic you know, worship and all these things, witchcraft and all this stuff, it explodes. What he said, as in the days of Noah. It will be in the end times, Jesus said. Certainly, this is what the days of Noah were like. These demons were either married or given in marriage. But in this case, they took, either took the form of humans or possessed some time of human form and then began to cohabitate and have children. Maybe actually had physical marriage. We don't know. That certainly uh, this, they were having children with these women. So, 
Verse 3 tells us there was a warning that came from the Lord as a result. The Hebrew word strive says, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive or abide in man forever. That word strive is one literally it means to be depressed or be inferior. The verse has been interpreted several different ways for different people, but it really seems to be that the Lord is warning that his spirit, which at the time of Noah seemed to be being overcome by what was evil going on, would only be for 120 years. And then something getting ready to happen. In other words, God was going to give these people living 120 more years to repent. And then the hammer's going to come down and the judgment's going to come. You know, one of the things we study, and I keep coming back to Lois Lynn likes the Revelation study. What did we see in Revelation? Well, there would be a war, there would be judgment fall, but God would give a warning. He sent 144,000, right? He sent two witnesses. He sent an angel circling around the earth. Anytime before judgment fall, he would always give warning. And even here we are in the earth, other side of the Bible, warnings are coming. And God says 120 years to repent and then judgment's coming. Now we know that one of the ways that Spirit ministered to people during this time period, just as he did on the other end, was through the, was through the angel and the 144,000 and the two witnesses, was two people that we talked about last week. Who went around preaching? Noah and Enoch. See, if you miss, if you miss something to watch the video, because it's building on top of each other. Enoch and Noah, we talked about last week, were, were always preaching. What were they preaching? Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. Uh, Peter talks about it, and Jude talks about it. Well, here we get one other thing that really comes from this. So we see what's going on. We've got these, these demonic angels that are down, pulling around with these women, and they're having offspring. Now we get from this here, Moses tells us, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also after, after when the sons of God, there they come, came to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. Now the words Nephilim, or mighty and renowned, describe the highest rank, most famous, reputable, powerful, fallen men who were living at that time period. People who were well known, well known names. They were highly ranked people. Now, the word Nephilim probably doesn't refer as much to the physical stature as to the social stature. But then again, there's a whole group of thought that says, yeah, these were physical stature. These were the giants. That when these angels cohabitated the women, the offspring ended up being giants. None other than like a buddy uh, that David took care of. Remember uh, Goliath was nine foot nine or whatever he was? So there is a school of thought that these people that came from this offspring were giants. Then there's others who argue they weren't giants physically, they were giants when it comes to spirit, their spirits and their power. In their positions on it, their social stature, I guess, is the key word. Regardless, whichever way you go, these godless satanic people were the leaders who were controlling the world during this time. But in 120 years, something's getting ready to happen. Well, like I said, as you know, I had a buddy of mine I was talking about, a couple of band buddies of mine might discuss this stuff, and I was talking about it today as I was coming out of the DA's office. And he's asking, I said, this is what you study. And I said this. And he says, you know, um, they, you know they couldn't have wiped all of completely the, if it, they're talking about really physical giants out because who lived years afterward as a giant? Goliath. So uh, he seemed to argue a little bit maybe towards the social static giants. You know, giants today, like when you think about people who got a lot of money and a lot of status. Yeah. Regardless, I like to give you both sides of the story. They were physical giants, or they were social giants. But anyway, they were evil and a product of this unnatural <laughs> union between fallen angels and humans. And I like to think of uh, that movie that Keanu Reeves was in, and Al Pacino called The Devil's Advocate, where his lawyer sells out. You ever seen that movie? He sells out to become a uh, a great lawyer who never loses a case. I don't know if it's like there, but anyway. Uh, and he had his pick of all these beautiful women, even though he was married to this other lady. And they would, these demons would take on these beautiful women's form, and, and all of a sudden he'd look at them, and they'd be, oh, and they'd be just figures and all that. Hey, kind of get a picture of what's going on here. Almost sounds science, uh, science fiction esque. This is physically what was going on during the earth. Well, judgment is getting ready to fall because we see over in first five, excuse me, first five. That the Lord saw that the wickedness was great. 
The word great was evil and vast and large. He said it was extreme wickedness. And the scripture says it's extreme. It must be pretty bad. He said he saw the wickedness, and here's one, he saw their hearts. And this is a pretty sad statement. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. We can understand that. And that every intention of the faults of his heart was evil. That's that means every time every, everything they thought was evil. Now, if you compare that to what Jesus said over to Matthew, that you want to know what it's going to be like in the day, in the last days before I come back, it'll be like as in the days of Noah. I think we see that people. Why else to get in somebody's mind, to take a gun, and go shoot children, or to shoot people just to be? It's got to be evil in the mind. So, you see, Jesus is warning to get in the play itself because he said the last days will be as in the days of Noah. Well, what were the days of Noah about? Complete evil. That everything these people thought, laying in bed at night, just wandering away, they could do evil. Anything they thought was complete evil. And God, He knew their hearts. And verse 6 says, He groans because of His wickedness. The word, he was sorrowful. Really translates, He groans. God groaned in the heart of this evil wickedness that He saw during His time period. And not only that, He was grieved because of the wickedness. It's a very emotional. We get you know, and we know that these words give God personification because hey, we can't understand a spirit. We have to put it in words that we can understand. His heart was grieved, and he was emotionally grieved because of what he saw. The wickedness was that bad. Now it has to be pretty bad for God to say that. I mean, we you know we can get discouraged and depressed and see things, but when God evaluates the world in that way, something bad is getting ready to happen. So the verse 7 says, So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. He was getting ready to lay something to tow waste or utterly destroy everything that was before him. And that's that's just let that sink in a little bit. I like to think between the lines. It wasn't but a couple chapters ago that what he's saying, God created the Sun and the moon, and he created the waters, and he created the streams and the animals, and they were good. And he created man on the sixth day, and it was very good, right? And now he looks at it and says, I wish I'd never created it in our terminology. That's pretty. I mean, think about it. just three chapters, three or four chapters, we're going from it was good and very good to now I will blot out everything. That I say, not only have I created man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I've made them. Now, have we ever, ever said that? Done something for somebody and it comes back and said, I wish I'd never done that. We've all been kind of saying, I wish I'd never done that. Or if I had it to do over again, how many times have we ever said that? <laughs> I mean, we've all said that. And gee, I mean, we know that God knew from the very beginning what's happened. But Moses and the Word Spirit has to put it in terminology that we can understand. And God says, I am sorry that I have made them. But in the midst of all this judgment, it's getting ready to fall on evil. We see what we said earlier, God's grace. And there's a song, but Noah found grace in the eye of the Lord. That's that brother just said. At this time, I said there was two lines of people in the earth, a line of Cain and a line of Seth. And both lineages had absolutely become so corrupt with the exception of one man. And Brother Jimmy, Jimmy said the other day, Noah. He said, Noah and his wife were in the ark. <clears throat> Noah was the exception. So while the rest of society was going about it as godless and fooling around with demons and doing it, Noah was pursuing godliness and is going to be spared because of the grace of God. The word grace or favor, this is the first time it appears in the Bible right here. Found favor or found grace, depending on what version you have. The grace always sounds better in the ear because you've heard the song, and we know old King James, what most people grew up with, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So as the Lord was sifting through the hearts and minds of the people on the earth, he's discovered there's only one man on the earth that's alive who should receive my grace. There's only one man who's still interested in walking with him. But guess what? He needed grace as well, right? Because he was human. 
Noah, as S. L. Johnson, his commentary says, is a prototype of a sinner saved by grace. So to escape the wrath of God, certainly we've got to be the recipient of the grace of God, and God's grace is found by faith in Christ. And we know that Hebrews tells us that, I'll get it out in a minute, Noah's righteousness was accounted to him as faith, which was always looking forward to the cross that was coming. Dr. Henry Morris, if you remember, read, was one of the great creationist writers in, in time, said there was 15 characteristics that existed in the days of Noah that will intensify as the Lord returns. Really coming on with uh, a prophecy study that Lois Lynn's trying to get to do. Here's 15 things that he says that will be in existence when the Lord comes the second time that was before the flood. Preoccupation with physical appetites. I don't think that means you just eat. That means feet, not only eating, but everything dealing with physical stuff. We're, we are obsessed with our physical body. As guilty as anybody, as vain as they come, you see it. But all you have to do is turn on the TV. You don't see ordinary people on the soap operas. Andrew was watching something like that, and guys on there, and they were all ripped up, and the girls were in their bikinis. Perfect bodies. Of course, they were plenty, so they must like them. <laughs> But we have a preoccupation with everything beautiful. Uh, plastic surgery and all these things are just running around. Second, rapid advances in technology. James can tell you that computer you got, Ronnie, you need to go get it and it's out of date. It's maybe, what, a year old? How many times you, was you get your Apple phone at Apple 10 and it's Apple 12 before you get used to learn how to use it? Technology explosion. Grossly materialistic attitudes and interests. Uniformitarian philosophies which are worldwide. We need to be active men. We all should get along. Should be one religion. Ignoring inordinate devotion to pleasure and comfort. No concern for God and either the belief or conduct. Uh, Dr. Jeremiah said the other day on the study of going to start Sunday school in a couple of weeks that one of the things that the majority of people now that when you say, What religion are you? You know, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, none. Over 51% of millennials are none. They're not, they're not, not really agnostics or atheists, but they're just not religious. No concern for God. They could care. They were apathetic. Well, we remember when we studied that lesson on apathetic. What does apathetic mean? I don't know. I don't care. That's the way society could care less about anything about the Lord. Disregard for the sacredness of marriage. Do I need to say any more about that? Rejection. That the word of God is inspired. Population explosion, widespread violence, corruption, preoccupation with illicit sex, widespread words and thoughts of blasphemy, organized satanic activity, and a promulgation of system and movements that are of abnormal depravity. I can still hear Adrian Rogers say the thing that people used to hide in the alleys and talk about, now they parade down the front street with flags. That's true. Adrian Roberts said that 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, back in the 90s. Now, we parade it as if it's nothing. It's all signs of the end times. And look, Jesus said it would be as in the days of Noah. And we see from just chapter 6 what was going on in Noah's time. This complete corruption and violence. And what happened within 120 years? A hammer fell. So what does that tell us? We better be careful. If we see these things happening now, a hammer may be beginning to fall sooner than you think. But let's move on. Let's talk about what God said. Let's begin uh, chapter, moving to chapter 6, verse 9, and read through the end. And, uh, Nancy, pick up there, verse 9. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his nature. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark of blooms, 
and shall cover it inside and put and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, and of the animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. <coughs> Thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. All right, we'll stop right there. Now verse 9 begins what we call the third Toledon. And we said when we first did our introduction, we said which means the generation of. And this section is the generation of Noah. This section really tells the story of the one life, well, we want to think of eight lives that God is like. Yeah. Six, seven, eight on this way, that God spared. It is as Dr. Ross in the commentary said, what became of Noah? <clears throat> now Noah was a, we learned, was a man right with God, and God was going to use him and bless him and spare him. No matter what was going around him, he was straight now. Let's talk about Noah. One of the things that we see in verse 9 is he was faithful to the Lord. Uh, he's described as being righteous and blameless, which describes his life. Now, before God and before the people, he lived this life that in God said was righteous and blameless. Now Noah was a righteous man who was innocent in his character, but that doesn't mean he didn't sin. He was what we call today a man of integrity. He had been forgiven of his sins and was faithful to the Lord, even though, you know, we know that you know nobody's perfect. The scriptures all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So but Noah was one of those people who found favor in God's eye was righteous because he lived his life dedicated to the righteous things and not to the evil things that were going around him. I like to think of this King David. David was the same way. Now, we studied the life of David, and if you want to study the life, just listen to Dr. Jeremiah for the next month, because he's teaching on it. And we love David, because David's a lot like us. He would do stuff, but the minute he'd do it, he'd confess it. The Lord would say, right, he's the one God in Scripture that God said he was a man after my own heart. So Noah was similar to that. He was righteous and faithful, even though he wasn't sinful, but he lived his life dedicated to the things of God. Now the prepositional phrase there, in his time, means that Noah maintained his faithfulness before the Lord throughout his entire lifetime. So his life wasn't perfect, wasn't sinless, but he was focused on and tried to live a righteous, innocent life, even when the rest of the world around him was completely wicked. Because what did we say? It was so wicked that it brought, I won't say it brought tears to God's eyes, but really, it was just completely a mess. Now notice the chronologically, Noah first found grace, and then he became a man who walked with God. So he had the grace that God gave him, and he became and walked with the Lord. Not only did he was faithful to God, that he had fellowship with him, we see it. He walked with him moment by moment, step by step. He had a close relationship with the Lord. Almost like, this is what I now, like Adam. I remember Adam walked with him in the garden, but then as a result of the fall, they, they were separated. He pretty much, in his daily life, everything he did was motivated and desired by a chance to walk with the Lord. And we know that his walk resulted in God describing him as a life of righteousness. It resulted in him being pro a proclamator of righteousness and certainly a faith that believed God in the midst of a rejecting world. So he soared out like a sore thumb. Now as a result of his faith and his walk, he was a fruitful man. He produced three sons. 
Remember these three names because they're going to take us to the next month. Shem, Ham, and Jacob. Now, through these people, the entire population as we know it today came from. So that's, think about that. That's Satan. So while the rest of the world was out producing godly, ungodly offspring that's getting ready to be wiped out, Noah produced a godly offspring that's going to be spared. And there's four reasons why we have this lineage part here. One, it's going to give us the historical data regarding the human lineage. As I said, everybody who's alive today came from the loins of Mrs. and Mrs. Noah. Why? What happened to everybody else? They're gone. They're getting ready to get wiped out. So that's what I said last week about Seth's line over here, which was completely evil, completely wiped off. Excuse me, Cain's line was completely wiped out. Seth's line is the righteous line that replaced Abel. Remember, Abel was the first son. He died and Seth came in. And through his lineage, who Noah came, is going to be everyone who ever lives today. Has to have come because everybody else was completely wiped out. And one of those three people you will find your lineage, if you are of the Jewish um, lineage, you would have come from Shem. If you were from the uh, the uh, Arabic, uh, Middle Eastern area, you would find your African area, you would find your descendants through Ham. The rest of us, the Gentiles, would have come through Jacob. So we could trace our ancestry right on back, and probably we would come from Jacob, unless we had some Jewish people <laughs> in our family. So we get this here, Historical data because it gives us the lineage of all humans. Here's the second important thing it gives us the lineage of one person that we care about the Messiah. Jesus would come through the line of Shem. It also gives us to demonstrate that Noah lived his life before a God in a way that benefited his entire family. And I'm trying to remember who said it the other day. Is it MacArthur? Maybe John MacArthur said. There are a lot of people who should be thankful that they are either married to, in a relationship with, or with somebody who's godly. Because a lot of times, a person's faith spills out and protects those around them. He said, if you're on an airplane with somebody, hopefully it's a believer flying the plane. Because many times God protects his own when they pray for it. And as a result, the fruits spill out to people who are with them. Think about it. If you're a godly Got a godly husband, say maybe the wife is not, or vice versa. And the husband is praying, protect my family and do this. The protective hand from his prayers protects the family. So people benefit from being in a relationship with a Christian. We see it right here. Noah's family was saved because they were of the land, they were in a relationship with Noah. How about if Mrs. Noah, we don't know the last name, was married to somebody in Seth's home? And guess what? She wouldn't have been on that boat. She'd have been drowned. But because she was in Noah's relationship, it benefited his entire family. Never thought of that. That's thinking outside the box. It's only the car can teach you to think. Or it may have been um, Chuck Smith Somebody else did. The fourth thing it proves that it's possible for a family to be blessed by God in a world that's out of control. You can have a godly family. Now let's move on into the juice of this section. What was the world like in verse 11 and 12? If direct Contrast to the uh, character of Noah here, Moses describes the character of the world as this. And notice two words that kept popping up that Nancy said. Anybody know what they were? Over and over. It was a corrupt society and full of what? V. Violence. Those two words were describing the world that had become a wasteful, corrupt place and ruin. Filled with violence and oppression and injury. What does that sound like? Okay. Sounds a lot like today. You turn on the TV, somebody got shot, somebody got run over, you know, you know, it's always a they said verse one chapter one, verse thirty one, in a world that was once classified God as good and very good is now a total waste. Now keep in mind the world was filled with invention and accomplishment. We had Tubal Cain, which was Cain's the Cain's son, the grandson, who was great in the metal works. And then his other son, who would go to play, teach Dan Nancy how to play the flute and piano. I mean, he wanted, I mean, he liked Michael W. Smith, he could just go and play. And the other guy was in the ranches. I mean, it was a place of invention and accomplishment. And in the midst of a population that was exploding, 
It was a population filled with, quote, good-looking people. Because the women were beautiful in the eyes of the men. It was a place of successful people. But it was a place filled with all forms of wickedness. And to God, it was a ruined wasteland. So what does God reveal to Noah in verses 13? The opening verse of verse 13 says, Then God said to Noah, is extremely important because it sh clearly shows that God revealed his truth to a godly man. And who's the godly man he spoke to? Noah. He said, Revelation number one, Noah, what I'm going to do to the world. We see divine retribution is God and there's grace in the midst of this divine retribution. He says the phrase, the end of all flesh, is a nice way of saying, I'm going to destroy and cut off all humanity. I'm going to wipe it completely out. Now it's significant that the Hebrew word destroy is the same word that is translated corrupt back in verse 11 and 12. So I'm going to destroy this corrupt world. That word play is teaching that as the people had destroyed their own way, a way which was apart from God, God was getting ready to destroy them. And Rusty said the other night, and I listened to that the other night in his revelation study, he said, you know, for peace, problems in the Roman study, when you keep denying the truth and you give it over to wickedness and evil, you are going to receive the wrath of God. And we see it play out in people. So well, that's not true. God's a loving God. He's not going to wipe, wipe us out today because we follow this path to do that. He had no problem doing it in Noah's day. And God is saying yesterday and today and forever. So God said, I want to show him that we've been taking the corrupt way. So what that teaches us is that Charles Sexton was right. What teaches that divine wrath is as much of God's activity as his grace is. He's as much a grace of God as he is a God of judgment. Now, people don't like to teach that a whole lot, but how do you get past this? This is nothing but the wrath of God going out in the entire world. So what does he want Noah to do? Because Noah says, God, I hear you, I ain't doing it. But what did he say? Oh no. And he obeyed the Lord. He followed his instructions. Reason one. He said, I want you to provide an ark which is going to provide security for you and your family. Number two. Not only did he want to provide security for Noah and his family, but all those cute little animals out there. I want you to provide an ark that's going to be an illustration of being faithful to the Word of God. Because we certainly see it's an idea of being in Christ. And the way of being in the ark. Fourthly, the ark will provide an illustration of the world's mockery and judgment. Second Peter 2 talks about that. You know, the world says, ah, nothing's going to change, it's going to be the same. And certainly, the ark provides an illustration of what we call sal of salvation by baptism. Now, what does this word ark mean? It translates to mean a chest or a coffer. Now, sometimes you've been to see the ark, right? Oh, yeah. Does it look like a, a, a normal sized boat? I, I never realized that. It look, the, the word translate art chest it looks like a big treasure chest or a coffin is the word that it translates as. Not like you know, you go on a cruise ship, it's got that beautifully shaped bow, bow or something to curve to it. It don't look like the Harper's Island built there. It doesn't. It don't have a fair balance. It doesn't look like that. And it even say the snakes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's designed to look more like a treasure chest or a coffin than a, than a boat. And those followers in line, they must be right for these people here that went to see it, so they're right. Gopher was made out of gopher wood. Now gopher wood comes from what they call pitch trees or resinous trees. Now, verse 15 gives us the dimension of the ark, which was somewhere like this, 450 feet long. Everybody shaking their head. 75 feet wide and 45 feet tall. That's, that's a monstrosity. Now, I love this, and y'all confirm this. This ark weren't meant for sailing, but for floating. Verse 16 says there was to be a window on top of the ark. And I hope they had a window on top of it. And a door on the side and three stories in it. A big door. That's a huge thing. Now, does anybody have, they may have told you why they had a window on top. 
Santa Barbara. Well, that one, yeah. Awesome. And see light. Yeah. See the drawings. You're right. The window at the top meant that the light and the oxygen could be supplied. Remember, they said this dark canvas was dark and everything. The light had to come in, you're right, and the oxygen had to come in. But why else was it letting go out? Yes. All those little animals in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, well, the commentary is talking about it. Not only did it let the light in, but it let the smell out. Yeah. Got out a little But the windows, were, but also, like Andy was saying, when they went to look up, when they went to see where the uh, war had been sighted, where was the first place they were going to look? God wanted to look up. So that's why the windows were on the top. The door certainly wouldn't be open yet. Time. But hey, you learn, see, you learn something every day. So that's the dimension of the ship. Well, God reveals exactly what He's going to do to the world. He says, I'm going to destroy this world by a flood. The psalmist would quote that very thing. Somebody read Psalm 2910. Can, can we? I mean, Miss Betty used to say that. They can't do anything without going to the Psalms. And she was right. I mean, we studied at that time. We studied all 150 of them. It took about two, a year to go through. And we always keep coming back. Psalm 29.10. The psalmist makes mention of this. The Lord said, in flying over the flood, the Lord is in flying as forever. So the psalmist says, the king is in a kingdom and is roamed over the flood. So God will sovereignly reign his king over this flood. Well, he knows what he's going to do for the world. What's he going to do for Noah? I keep doing that tongue and cheek. He got wound up that day calling him that He makes a covenant. This is the first covenant that we see here. A covenant, a legal binding promise that God makes, which obligates God to fulfill the promise. And the first covenant in the Bible is certainly one of salvation. What do you want to do with Noah? And he does it in verse 18. What does he say? But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark. Your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. So he goes in. So what does he want Noah to do? Noah got, you know, Noah got to do this one. He wanted him to get at least one male and female of every type of living thing, including birds and animals. Now, this is where some people say, that couldn't be true, but how in the world could Noah get all these animals in there? But notice the next key word. They came to him. She, look at that. Somebody's been studying over here. Now, who do you think put, it, put that drive in those animals to come in? Uh, if God created an animal, he put a drive in the animal and tell him where to go. And then people say, well, how did he get a koala bear from Australia if he's got to get across the ocean to get there? God can do anything. Well, he can do anything, but guess what? Most people think during this time that the flood hasn't happened yet, the continents were already together. Because there was no sea separating anything. So the claw bear could just walk over there. Had 120 years to get there, right? <laughs> so anyway, we got all that time. So he tells them to get one of these animals, one of each of these animals. And notice, and she said, notice the animals would come to him. He didn't have to go get them. They came to him. Now this particular judge would be expanded. We're going to find out in just a minute when we read this next chapter. I'm going to have Nancy read in seven. That there were some more animals than others coming. We want to find out why that's on there. That's important. Do I know why? Have any idea why that would be there? For sacrificial purposes. Because what would Noah and his family? They were still sinners, and they still had to give a sacrifice. And we'll see that just then. And he needed what kind of sacrifice? A blood sacrifice. That really talked about it for the sin sacrifice. And you're right. So we're going to see that. Well, no one was that way, and certainly we're going to see that we're going to need those animal sacrifices until the ultimate sacrifice, which would come through Noah's line. Noah produced Shem, and Shem produced Abraham, and through Abraham would come none other than the Lord Jesus. Well, what did Noah do? He obeyed God completely. This quality seems to stand out in the life of Noah, and is stressed over and over when I listen as Nancy was reading, and he obeyed God, and he did what he said, and he obeyed. So, Noah was one man interested in carefully obeying everything the Lord said. And while the rest of the world was doing whatever it wanted, Noah was doing what God wanted. 
And certainly, we see that playing itself out today as God calls certain people to do things, and the rest of the world continues to do what it wants to do and just totally reject anything God. We're well, just look at the last section that we'll read before we get through. We've got a little bit of time. Let's turn over to chapter 7, Nancy, start reading. And I'll conclude with this since next week we'll be off. I thought you would get them. Read them, please. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and your household. For you alone I have saying to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and the animals that are not clean too, a male and his female. Also the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. There we go. You just said it, right? Yep. <laughs> now Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of the water came upon the earth. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean, and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. It came about after seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were open. The rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh, in which was the breath of life. Those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God commanded him, and the Lord closed it behind him. Then the flood came upon the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark, so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed fifteen cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. All flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth, and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in those nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, God. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth. And only Noah was left, together with those that were with him in the ark. The water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. But I think there's some things in there that was repeated that I think he got the point of. This is a very serious chapter here. Well, scientists over the years have concluded that fossils come, you know what, we know what fossils are, right? We studied in school, come from a catastrophe. Um, a worldwide flood is not a speculation. One of the commentaries I read said that almost every one of the world's religions has some kind of reference to a worldwide flood, whether it's from the witchcraft, witchcraft, witch doctors, Indians, whatever it is, some kind of theology that seems to be a worldwide flood, you know, a worldwide catastrophe. But we know the word of God that it's factual, provable, not just fossil, fossil and geographical discoveries tell us that, the word of God tells us that. Now, God didn't send the flood so scientists could explain what fossils are. We know what he said a while ago why he sent it. It was the wrath and judgmental destruction. And so with the exception of these few animals that are in the uh, ark and one family, every single thing on earth was destroyed and wiped out. Think about that. that that's that sink deep in. Every single thing as we know it on earth was wiped out. Huge population was set, with the exception of eight humans 
And all those animals that were on the ark, y'all seen the ark. I mean, it carries a lot of steel. It's not like what we see. So what we come to this is when wickedness reaches a certain level, the destructive judgment will come, but God will always preserve a remnant. We talked about, we said in uh, Revelation, we saw that on the seven churches in Revelation. In every church, in every generation, everything could be complete. God always keeps his remnant. Keeps stuff going. Well, let's see this, this narrative. Here. There's a lot of this in narrative. The first nine verses, we see the entrance into the ark. The entrance was not just Moses. I think you ought to get in the boat. It was a divine command. The verb enter is a command, which means God was telling Noah and him to get in the ark. Like he tells you, he tells you. And the basis for his command was the righteous should know. Noah didn't get in there because he looked prettier than everybody else. Right? He was granted right to get in there because he was righteous in God's eyes. It was attributed to him. Not sinless, I'm not saying that. Because why? He needed those sacrificial animals that we're going to talk about. So he was still a sinner. But he lived his life in a way that God that conformed to God's standards and it was imputed to him in righteousness. So God said, get in the boat. It'd be like he said, William Barber, get in the boat. Notice he didn't say, well, let me, uh, let me go change my clothes or let me run the store and uh, get in the boat. Well, their interest was not only just in, but the animals went in. Now, it seems to me, and this is taken outside the box a little bit here, for those that know the Old Testament, there was obviously a known distinction, excuse me, a distinction in the mind of Noah between what we call clean and unclean animals. Anybody that studied Leviticus and Deuteronomy know what I'm talking about. The Levitical in Leviticus and the Deuteronomy, I love those words, kind of like that fancy word I talk about last week, anti-diluvian, remember that once? For those that were here last week, I like that word, people who were before the flood. Was apparently operated in the sacrificial system during the night days of Noah. And what do I mean by that? Remember when the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, there were certain animals that they could eat and something they shouldn't, remember? That's why today, if you go talk to an Orthodox Jewish person, you don't, they won't go eat pig and pork, right? It was seen unclean. And, and then it all came to an end in Acts when Peter was eating was on the roof and he had that dream and he said, I can't eat that stuff. And God said, what I call clean, don't you will call unclean. So there was no longer that separation that they're under. But before, remember Abraham has a covenant. Moses has a covenant the scene. This is pre-Moses. There was some kind of sacrificial distinction between clean and unclean as far back as Noah's day. Now, notice this. I never learned something. Clean beasts or clean animals were required to be taken into the ark by sevens. And the unclean animals by what? The numeral distinction has to do with not only what they had to eat survival, but sacrifice. Because they weren't going to sacrifice the clean animals. It was the unclean animals that would be sacrificed. And there was more of those because they came in groups of sevens. There you go. The clean, you know. the clean animals. Yes. Not the unclean. No. They, they were not going to eat them. They were going to sacrifice them to the Lord. The unclean they were going to keep the two the clean to last into the future. The unclean ones would be the ones that were sacrificed. Because they were coming. Was it, this failed to come in two. What are they going to do? What are going Because they're not going to eat the unclean ones. He wouldn't eat the unclean ones. He would only eat the clean ones. Remember? And by the way, they're not going to eat the meat anyway, because what? They're not meat eaters. They haven't come on the scene yet. Alright, so the entrance was given by divine command, the given of the animal, and was according to divine time. At the time God told Noah, in our little story of him, Barbara going to get in the ark with the family and the animals, the earth had how many days, did he say? Seven, Seven days. Seven indicates any time in Revelation, how many times? Seven, seven trumpets, seven vials, seven bowls. Seven is the complete amount. It's the limit. Okay. This is God's last word of judgment. He says, I'm going to blot out everything. You've got seven days. So here's one more last opportunity for the people to come and say, Hey, I'm going to repent. I want to get in there with you. And certainly if somebody did, they were going to. 
So we know if we compare it to our future time, seven years before Jesus comes back, what happened? The tribulation, the rapture, all that stuff that we studied in Revelation. Seven in the kingdom. So he was given seven, seven, seven days, I wish you get in there. Fourth thing with this, he was the entrance was by immediate obedience. Obedience to God's word was a key feature that separated Noah from everybody else. Noah all we did it was it jutted out one ago when the answer didn't read it. And what he did, and he obeyed. And he obeyed. And he obeyed. Well, let's talk about the entrance of the flood. Notice how carefully God fulfills the prophecy. He does it literally. He said waters began to gush forth, and waters from below and above began to pour up onto the earth. And all who were not in the ark were faced with this tremendous outburst of water. We said, well, it couldn't have rained that much. Go back to day two. What did he create? The furnace. And he separated the furnace. Remember he said he created the heavens and the earth and the first was without, was, was without void and on the second day he separated waters above and waters below. The formula. So when God said it's time, the waters came from below and the, gut, the springs began to gush from below. So that water didn't just rain down and fill the earth. It came with the addition of rain that poured out of the ground poured out of the heaven. For 40 days and nights the waters came and gush, the gushing was so powerful that there had been animals discovered in the Arctic regions that were found literally frozen in mid leap Have you ever seen that movie uh, Day After Tomorrow, you see, where they talk about, you know, the world comes to another ice age and the people are moving and all of a sudden they just stop and freeze immediately. You know, and then one of the guys in it says, Hey, I saw a woolly mammoth that was in the uh, Smithsonian Museum Institute. And he said he was frozen and he had, still had food in his mouth. So this, if you think about it, at the bottom, now Dr. MacArthur, his commentary talks about maybe he says some theories about, you know, the, all the volcanic uh, stuff on the ground exploded out and it opened and the gushers came forward and when it went into the sky, it walked the rain down. He said, you know, certain, just some theory on it, regardless, the water came pouring out of the atmosphere, came gushing out of the earth. And you can imagine if you're running all of a sudden, you don't know that just catching you. And you're just frozen in time. So the animals have been found frozen in mid -leaf. Now verses 17 and 20 inform us that the water level reached an unprecedented level. 15 cubits, or 22 and a half feet above the highest mountain in the world. Now, what were we in Bethany Ridge? About 13,000 feet up there in Colorado? Well, I think Everest is higher than that, 28, 30,000 feet above. So think about 30,000 feet, and the water is 22 feet above that. That's a lot of water. It's, it's, it's staggering when you realize that the high, here it is, I'm looking, the highest mountain in the world is Mount Everest, which is 29,028 feet. So, you know, that mountain we were seeing in Breckenridge was, what, 13,000. So add another, what, uh, 16,000 feet. I know I couldn't breathe there. But let Terry, she, she can get it. But 15 feet above the highest mountain, nearly five and a half miles high. A staggering the mountain of water. Well, obviously a flood of that magnitude would produce the results described in these verses. Every single thing done. It's been discovered by geologists. I'm going to research this stuff. MacArthur adds this stuff. Dr. Thompson, in his commentary, says that many of the faster type animals were found fossilized in higher elevated spots of the world, like a jaguar or a cheetah. Some of these animals that move faster were found in higher elevations. Why? What were they doing? Running right away from the flood. But when it's five and a half miles and over the tallest mountain, they ain't nowhere to go. So obviously as the flood came, the animals could run to the top, but that's as far as they can go. But I love his quote, when the purpose of God is to destroy everything, there is no escape. Well, the extent of the flood was the whole world. The chapter is very clear, and there's some commentaries that, that people argue today, that well, this was just a localized flood. It just happened in the Middle East. It just happened around the Egypt area. But, how can we get past some of these evidences? 
This chapter is very clear that this flood covered the whole entire world and destroyed everything. Here's some of the evidences that people said. One thing, rainbows are universal. Everywhere you go in the world, there's a rainbow. You have a rainbow. And what did God say? The rainbows are proof that I will never destroy the earth by rain again. So it, it would have to be universal. Geology all over the world indicates there was high water all over the world. In many different places you can go to the highest mountains to the lowest area, you can see sediment levels were things that would be like shells and fossils, rats on How else would you get uh, a fish bone at the top of Mount Everest? It's Mr. War of them. Here, guys, if y'all went to Kentucky, the, the size of an ark to include Noah and his wife and his family and kids and all the animals demand that it had to be a universal flood. That just wouldn't be localized. Anything created that big. Here's one that makes the most difference. Somebody read Luke 11, 26 and 27. And we'll go to the master teacher himself, see what he has to say about it. Luke, 20, Luke 11, 26 and 27. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, "Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you." Is that Luke 11, 26, 27? Mm -hmm. huh. Well, man, he wrote, he, I wrote the wrong number down. <laughs> I was wondering what it had. So. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know what I wrote down. It was supposed to be that God, Jesus, Jesus himself, used the illustration of himself coming into the world. Maybe I wrote, I wrote it down. Well, James, I'm that well, right? Maybe we can find out after we get through for research. Well, just try this. Somebody read 2 Peter 3, 6 to 11. Let's see if I get this one wrong. Fire him. Bring it on. Get rid of him. Give us the wrong description. Let's see what 2 Peter, what Peter said. Maybe this was the important. Did my daughter? Peter 3, 1. 6 and then 10 and 11. 2 Peter 3, 6. In which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. And we can land. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? All right, so Peter says, you know, the first time the world was destroyed, was destroyed by what? Blood. The second time it will be by fire. So if Peter's recognized it, and if I don't, God gave you the right scripture, we'll find it in a minute that Jesus himself said that he used the flood as an illustration of what it would be like when he comes back. Certainly, if Peter and Jesus said it, it's got to be some truth that it happened. Well, this right now with this, let me give you the chronological of the flood, what it looks like. I'm going to give it to you, and then in two weeks we'll pick up in chapter 8 of what's going on. 40 days and 40 nights of rain. At this point, we've been 40 days in the, in the ark, right? 110 more days when the water continued to rise, which means the last thing we read was 150 days. So they were in there in 40 days and 40 nights at the beginning of the rain, 
all the dust can come out. And then at 110 more days, the water continues to rise. Which means he's been in God, ladies, that you're in, in that ark that you all saw with your wife, your in your sons and daughters in laws, and all those animals have been in there 150 days. 150 days is what, uh, three months? Four months, right? Close to four months. 74 more days uh, was the water was going and decreasing to the 17th day of the seventh month as to the first day of the 10th month. That comes from next week. Um, chapter 8, we'll get that. So at that point, they're going to be in there for 224 days. Then there's 40 more days before Noah sent out an angel said the rain. This is all in chapter 8, I'm going to catch story. So at that point, they've been in there 271 days. Okay. Seven more days elapsed before Noah sends out that dove a second time, right? Which means he'd been there 278 days. Well, seven more days elapsed before Noah sends out the dove for the third time. So they've been in there 285 days. Then there's 20 more days, 29 more days elapsed from the second month to the 17th day of the year until the first day of the first month of reading chapter 8, which means it's 314 days. And then lastly, it was 57 more days until they could get out of the ark and go So they were in there for a grand total of, you might know, 371 days. That's a long time to be in that boat, you all saw. All the judgment certainly was precise, precisely calculated to what God wanted. So we see that when Noah spoke of a future coming judgment as he was building the ark for what is it, 120 years? I think what they said it was. The people were laughing and mocking, but he stayed faithful and he kept working and warning, building a boat. I don't know if he was Mark as I learned how to build a boat, but I'm going to show what I'm talking about before I go. But certainly, the Lord gave him the wisdom. And then one day, God says, You, your wife, get into the ark, the rest of the world in trouble. And you know, there were probably those who shook their fists and cursed and did whatever they wanted to do, but everything was according to God's timeline. And so, we see as a result that only one man and his family escaped the wrath of God, and it was because none of them had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So when we pick up back in chapter 8, we will finish up as the flood begins to subside, and then we will have that great covenant with God where he puts the rainbow in the sky, and then we will begin to talk about where all these descendants end up, and if anybody's ever studied Ezekiel and part of Revelation, and Daniel, you understand these words like Togamata and uh, uh, gosh, what's that name? Uh, one of those funky names. Uh, Gomer and Tubal and Magog and God. Remember those names from Revelation? This is where they come from. Where the sons of Noah went and laid their claim where they live. And then we will ultimately meet a guy named Nimrod in a couple of weeks. Who's going to build something? I know he's going to build it. Tower. So that's what's coming probably in the next two times we said. You might not even have it. It's hard to believe that all the people in the world that were there at that time and that only that family went in. I mean, think about that. That's no wonder God said it was totally wicked. Yeah. But what's going to happen now? Same thing. Only those who are righteous in God will be saved. And all of, oh, well, I, you know, this and that. I mean, Jesus said it would be, I mean, Uncle James was sitting there about where uh, Terry was at, and he said, My favorite verse is right in the days of Noah. <coughs> Jesus said, hey, what would, the disciples said, what would it be like in the end time when you come back? He said, it would be like it was in the day of Noah. We just saw it. Only eight people escaped. And I think about my work. You know, I work for a corporation now. You know, I mean, it is constant beating in our head. You know, what we have to, to live by in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And I think about the younger generation. 
and on the female ear, and that is the second event. It's second. It is very, very sad. sad. Mm -hmm. It's going to be so common. Mm -hmm. And people are saying, you know, oh, God's a God of God. This is a God of grace. He won't allow this to happen. It happened before. And Peter said it's going to happen then. And Jesus said it's going to happen then. So it's heads are running. Lois said the prophecy is the key. You know, it's, it's not just interesting, but it's really a warning of what's to come. That, you know, don't play around with some of this stuff. Anything else to add to it? But you're right to think about it. There are a whole world of millions of people. Only eight people were saved in the boat. Eight people. That just, it blows me away that nobody else, they heard the word. Because he preached for 120 years. Yeah. I mean, they heard the word. And they did not yeah. go. Not only did he hear from Noah, but Enoch, before he was raptured. And I'm sure Methuselah was probably teaching it. But remember, he, and then Enoch came to faith when he had his, his son. But I think about when I, I have to listen to all that stuff and go to all those, we have to watch all those webinars and all that stuff. And I think about the kids that don't go to church and how their minds are going to be conditioned. Yep. It's really scary. Well, Jeremiah said, Something that was profound. He said, you know, you used to, the most harsh word that a person could say when I'm sick or I'm tired. Now people don't, this is the word that, especially children say, I'm bored. I'm bored. Because, you know, and they say, this is boring, studying about the word. But like you said, it's there. It's a, it's, a, it's a very serious chapter to be in there. I, I don't think I ever thought about it until you mentioned it about eight people. Eight. Eight people out of an entire universe. And they heard the word. And heard. They heard the word. Because they, Paul says they were all without excuse. Wow. Good stuff. In this teacher's hollering out. Don't use that word stuff out here to educate. Good thinking. Anybody got anything else? I went a little bit over, but I want to get it into a good stopping point. You don't have to listen to the next week, so hey, you listen to it on the lecture. This is Father, we just come to you and we certainly thank you for grace. Lord, that word that some people use the acronym God's riches at Christ's expense. Good way to understand it. The grace that John Newton sings about, that's amazing. The grace that Apostle Paul teaches about, Noah found it way back in. It's just staggering to us, as Lenora said, that in a world of all these people, of living all of 987 years Methuselah had before the flood was going to come, that eight people, eight people, heeded your word, found righteousness, and went in and protected in the heart. And your words, you yourself said that you were here. That as it was, how's it going to be in the days, the end times, as it was in the days of Noah. We went through that list a while ago that we saw all the things, population explosion, technology explosion, apathy, all the things that come out of your word that tells us what's going on as the time ends. And it is. We're getting closer. And if these things are allowed before you come, the rapture can occur in a minute. We see these things play themselves out. That means we could be within seven years of your second return, which means the rapture could be immediate. And so many people around us could care less. Apathetic. I don't know. I don't care. May it burden our heart to live our lives to tell other people about what's going on so they can understand the truth before they are washed away with the flood of wrath, but this time with, with fire and brimstone. Thank you for the word. Thank you for opening our eyes to understand. Let this word fall on the ears and need to hear it not only here, but somebody out listening on video land. That it may change their life. Thank you for the opportunity to teach. Thank you for your word. And for those who are here, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.